before they started on their ministry. It's also been one week since Jesus rose from the dead. Now we can wander along with the disciples now that Jesus has risen from the dead and he's completed what he came to earth for. We can finally get back to our normal lives, back to the way things used to be. After all, Jesus said that the Old Testament prophecies that the Lord must suffer, die, and rise again, that those were all fulfilled. So the work's all done. We're saved. That's all there's left to it, right? Except for one thing. We know that once we meet Jesus, we can never go back to the way things were. We're totally transformed. We're changed. We're, we're not the same people that we used to be. If we go back to, to John chapter 20, verse 21 and 23, we can read what happened on Resurrection Sunday night. We see Jesus and the disciples in the upper room behind the locked doors. And again, Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed the Holy Spirit into them. These poor disciples, they've been through so much. They, they saw Jesus tortured and crucified. Then they saw him rise from the dead with something no one has ever done before. And they just didn't know what to do. They figure that his job's done, so their work is done. But the first thing he tells them is, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you out into the world. You can't be safe anymore. After all this stress, can you blame them for wanting to go fishing? When we're under stress, we all do different things. Sometimes people turn to, to drinking too much or, or some other unhealthy activity. Or other people go out for a run. <laughs> Or maybe some people pray and open up scripture. We all do something different to calm ourselves down after a time of stress. When my mom died when she was just 51, all I wanted to do was get back to work. I wanted life to become normal again. But the same thing, when, when something that tragic happens to you, you, you don't go back to normal. There's no normal anymore. It's all different. As the Father has sent me I am sending you, Jesus told them. I'm sending you fishing. Jesus told them before, I'm going to send you to fish for men, but they still didn't get it. So they did what they knew. They went back out to fish for fish. So these expert fishermen, they're trying to get back to normal. They're trying to get back to the things they used to do. Have any of you had that experience? But you find out that once you found Jesus, you never go back. So normally we would expect these expert fishermen to go out there, catch a, a boatload of fish and that they could sell. After all, this was how they made their living. But that's not what happens. We find out that in Scripture, when we read Scripture, the disciples never catch any fish without the help of Jesus. You can look in the bulletin and, and find all the listing of scriptures. And when you read Luke chapter 5, verses 6 to 7, you find out that once again the disciples are out there all night and they don't catch any fish. There's six lessons we're going to learn from today's reading. Lesson number one, no matter how much we might want someone to come to Christ, to be saved, or no matter how much we want our ministries to be fruitful, nothing happens until we call on Jesus to help us. Just like the disciples couldn't catch any fish without calling on Jesus, without admitting they couldn't do it themselves, we have to do the same thing. We have to ask Jesus first to help us because we can't get it done ourselves. So once again, they're, they're out there fishing all night in the darkness of night. Did you ever have a real time of darkness? Or maybe did you ever wake up in the middle of the night and realize you can't do it all by yourself? That you're not out there all alone, though? That's when you call out to God for his help. When Jesus was on the shore and he said, Friends, have you no fish? He didn't do that to taunt them. He offered that as a question to see how they would respond. Would they look in their boat and say, Yeah, yeah, we got a whole bunch of fish, no problem. Or would they finally admit, No, we haven't caught a thing. We need you to help us, Jesus. And that's what they did. They said, nope, we don't have any fish. That's lesson number two we can learn today. When you need Jesus' help, don't be afraid to ask for it. 
Don't be so proud to think that you can do this all by yourself. Realize that he's out there, that we can ask him for help. We can ask God to send us what we need to get the job done. Realize that Jesus loves us. He died for us. He loves us that much. But don't ask for Jesus for anything frivolous. Don't ask him for that new truck, that new boat, that vacation, because you won't get it. Jesus is no genie that we can rub the magic lamp and get whatever we want. But when we ask him for something that's God's will, you get your answer back pretty quickly. Every time I've asked God for, for something that's his will, I get it. We can do the same thing. Solomon asked for God's wisdom to lead God's people, and he received it. We can get the same thing. All we need to do is ask for his help. So these disciples, these expert fishermen, they realize that they can't do it by themselves. No, we didn't catch any fish, they said. So Jesus' response was classic. Well, if you didn't catch anything on the left side, throw it net on the right side. And to us, it, it doesn't seem like a big deal. All you're doing is throwing it from one side to the other. But see, for these fishermen in Jesus' time, it was a big deal. They've never done that before. They've always fished from the left side of the boat. Never the right side. But there's a good reason for that. Because when you put your net on the left-hand side of the boat, you can use your stronger right arm to bring the net in. That's why they always use the left side. So here when Jesus tells them to put it on the right side, it's a big deal. That means they have to use their weaker left arm to bring in the net. But they didn't question God. They didn't question Jesus. They did it immediately. And as soon as they did, the net was filled. These days, a lot of our churches have been accustomed to fishing on one side of the boat. Doing things the same way over and over again because we've always done it that way. We've always fished on this side of the town. But what if we fish on the other side of the town? What could happen? Maybe the net gets filled. Another thing I was wondering about, though, was, was the number 153. Why was John so specific when he said 153 fish were caught? And I was hoping to find this, this miracle answer that would explain everything. But I didn't find one website, I didn't find one commentary who said the same thing. Some of them said that 153 was the number of nations in the world at that time. So that means that, that God tells us to go out to all the nations. Another commentary said, well, there were only 153 different species of fish at the time. So that means all the fish were caught. But since none of them agreed, who knows what 153 means? We'll have to wait until we get up there to ask. We'll ask John, what's the deal with 153? Who knows what he's going to say? But I wonder, what would this church look like if we had 153 more fish in the seats, maybe 153 more people, because fish might stink. <laughs> but what would happen if we had 153 more people in this church? What would be the impact of this church on the community, on those extra 153 people, when they would walk into church to feel the love that you give them? They would be able to sing here worship up hymns and pray and hear scriptures. I think it would be an incredible impact. Notice in verse 6 that the net was filled with fish as soon as they obeyed Jesus. No hesitation. As soon as they did what Jesus asked them, they were abundantly blessed. We're called out to reach out to every type of person, no matter who they are, where they live, we're just called to throw the net over the right side, and Jesus will bring them in. And when we do this, then we can feast at God's banquet. That's the next thing I learned reading this scripture. Look at verse 9. Now, I, I never noticed this until this past week as I was reading this verse. In verse 9, it says, When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus didn't need them to catch any fish. Once again, Jesus provided fish for them. 
He not only provided them with an abundant catch, he provided them a breakfast. Just like he had done in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John when he provided a meal to 5,000 men and their, their families. Jesus doesn't need us to do anything, but he asks us to go out on a mission for him. And when we ask him to help us, he will. Lesson number three from today's reading, when Jesus tells us to do something different, we should do it. And when we do, we won't regard it. When Jesus tells us to turn right, we do it. When Jesus told me to become a pastor after spending over 35 years as a, a manager in retirement consulting firms, I did it. Now, I never, do, never, never did it before. But he said, do it, so I did it. And I'll tell you, I would never look back. My life has been blessed so much since I've done it. I can't tell you. Do what he says, and you'll be blessed. Forget about the, the same old ways you did things, that you've never done it before, and just obey. Sometimes God wants us to try something new, because he knows there's something better for us, instead of the old way. Lesson number four, John recognized Jesus before all the other disciples in the boat. John was just like the other disciples. He spent three years with Jesus, but there was one big difference with John. John got closer to Jesus. He spent time with Jesus, so much so that when Jesus was being crucified on Good Friday, he entrusted his mother to John. We can get close to Jesus too. Through prayer and through reading the scripture, we can understand Jesus more. So that we'll understand when he's talking to us, when he's calling us. If we don't open up scripture, if we don't allow God to talk to us through scripture, and if we don't talk back to him in prayer, we'll never know when he's talking to us. We'll let that message slip by as, as maybe just a whisper in our ear, or maybe a thought, instead of truly the word of God. Jesus told us in John 15, verse 7, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Now, abide means to bring God into you. So when you read Scripture, don't just breeze over it. Dive into it. Let, it. let it come into you like we did during our Lectio Divina studies during Lent, where we read Scripture repeatedly, and every time we got something different. And everybody in, that was gathered here got something different also. So gather together, read scripture, let it sink into you, and discuss it with other people. And God will talk to you through scripture. John recognized Jesus first, but who went to Jesus first? Just like on Resurrection Sunday, John got to the tomb first. John was younger. He was faster. He got to the tomb first. But who went in? Peter. Peter went in first. Just like today, John recognized that it was Jesus, but who jumped out of that boat first? Peter. We all have different talents and skills, and every one of us has to use those God-given skills for the good of this church. I've said this before, and I'm going to keep saying it. God gave each of us skills. God gave each of us a job to do. And if we don't use those skills for his church, that need goes unmet. We see it all the time in church. At New Hope and Retreat, we need somebody with a power washer so they can wash down the parsonage for Pastor Pam. I don't have one. And when I tried to use it on the, the roof of the church, <laughs> Barrett had to catch me before I slid <laughs> off the roof. No, Over not. at Faith, we need someone to teach Sunday school. We need someone to, to help out VBS. They have a lot of needs. Here at Westby, we need someone to, to film worship. And that's important because through the, the recording of worship, we get our worship service out to people who can't come to church. Our members who are at Maplewood, Norseland, Creamery Creek, and everywhere who can't get to worship on Sunday, they get to watch it. They get to be with us. That's a very important ministry. And there's other things we need people to do. Pray, open up scripture, and ask Jesus, what can I do for your church? What kind of skills did you give me for your church? 
And the last lesson we need to take away from today's reading is in verse 14. We hear that this is the third time that Jesus met with his disciples. And we know that three is a perfect number in the Bible, meaning it's complete. So this tells us that Jesus' work on earth is done. He's done everything he's going to do for us, except be with us. So this means that we need to take over. We need to accept the job that he's given us to go and make disciples. As the Father sent him, so he sends us. Amen.